Picture any Tim Burton film, and you'll conjure up just about the same aesthetic. An often humorous, sci-fi, fantasy-inspired take on the pale characters who linger in the depths of our imaginations and our darkest nightmares. Covered in all the German expressionism that a dude could get his hands on, Burton remains a master of his own personal style, unachieved by any other filmmaker. A style that helped create the modern superhero movie. A style that revolutionized stop-motion animation. A style that brought to life unique gems with an independent spirit. And a style that still keeps Hot Topic in business at malls around the world. But when did that style top the substance? Has Tim Burton overdone it and become a parody of himself? It sure is something that's worth exploring down that dark, curvy, twisted road of this one-of-a-kind filmmaker's life and career. So yeah, bottom line, what the f*** happened to Tim Burton? They expect something from you, and then you get, then they think, oh, it's a Tim Burton film, or, that, or you do something different, it's like, oh, it's not like one. So it's a weird sort of, it's a weird sort of no-win situation in some cases. But to truly understand what the f*** happened to Tim Burton, we must begin at the beginning. The beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1958, Burbank, California. Growing up, young Timmy Boy had a fascination with the spooky and the macabre, taking to the likes of Vincent Price and other horror sci-fi icons. He immediately fell in love with art, especially illustrating and cinema. After high school, Tim Burton attended Cal Arts to study animation. It was there he directed the animated short, Stock of the Celery Monster, which miraculously caught the attention of Disney, who assigned him to work on The Fox and the Hound and The Black Cauldron. But ultimately, his work and designs did not make the final cut of those Disney movies. Meanwhile, at Disney, Tim Burton was spending more time fiddling with his own projects, like the short film Vincent, based on one of his own poems about a young boy who was obsessed with Vincent Price. A hint at some of Tim Burton's other future autobiographical works to come. In addition to Vincent, Tim Burton directed a supremely unsettling spin on Hansel and Gretel that aired on the Disney Channel exactly one time. Who could these two little buddies be? Have they come to stay with me? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, come in, Dibbies, come in. And then came 1984's Frankenweenie, his true breakout short film. And it also got him canned at the House of Mouse, with the studio saying that he was using too many of Disney's resources on his weird little projects. So Tim Burton went on an adventure, a big adventure. After meeting Paul Rubens, Mr. Paul shared his desire to give his maniac man-child character Pee Wee Herman his big screen debut. Burton was the perfect director. He was just demented enough just witty enough, and just eccentric enough to take on this big adventure. 1985's Pee-wee's Big Adventure was a gigantic success, pulling in more than five times its budget, and putting Burton on the Hollywood map of bankable directors of off-kilter material. Those big Hollywood studio fat cats, they were like, hey, I like him, he's got moxie. Next came 1988's Beetlejuice. This was chock full of the aesthetics that Tim Burton would be known for. Like quirky families, cartoonish energy with a taste of the goth movement. Beetlejuice was an instant classic, breaking new ground in the horror comedy genre. Tim Burton directs a wonderful performance from Michael Keaton. This outrageously original flick was one of the top 10 grossing movies of the year. 1988, and would earn an Oscar nomination for Best Makeup, one of the most frequent categories that Burton's films would be nominated in. <laughs> Tim Burton would hit a peak the following year with Batman. With a nearly $50 million budget, it was by far his biggest, 
And since Tim Burton was admittedly not a comic book fan, it was undoubtedly his most daunting task. Fans of the Caped Crusader were rightfully skeptical. They were like, wait, you mean the Pee Wee Herman guy and the Mr. Mom guy are gonna make a Batman movie? But Timbo proved them all wrong. They of course pulled it all off in glorious fashion, but did upset a couple diehard fans by changing who killed Mommy and Daddy Wayne. Still, legacy-wise, it ushered in a Batman that embraced the pure, gothic darkness of the character. And this little super-duper Bat movie, it made a staggering $250 million at the box office, making it the biggest hit of the entire decade, completely destroying Disney's Little Mermaid at the box office, which must have put a Joker-sized smile on Tim Burton's face. This lights out! Now you wanna get nuts? Come on! Let's get nuts. The 1990s launched with Edward Scissorhands, another Best Makeup Oscar nominee. This movie allowed Tim Burton to go back to his roots in many ways, as this film was based off of his sketches that he did as a teenager, and also featured his beloved Vincent Price in his final film performance. The film Edward Scissorhands is a pure passion project, a visually stunning, remarkably human story. It is a beautiful and imaginative film that only Tim Burton could have made. Tim gets to explore and have fun with his creativity, but he never goes overboard with this one when it comes to his style. Unlike some of his other later films, which we will talk about after these messages. Batman right back. Batman <laughs> Batman returns. Bruce Wayne figure included with custom coupe. Other figures sold separately. Up next was 1992's Batman Returns, which took Tim Burton back to Gotham. Although often balked at for being bloated and twisting character logic, Batman Returns is one of the stronger superhero sequels ever made, featuring some of the greatest villains we've ever seen. It was again a box office monster, and earned Oscar nominations for makeup and visual effects. But many thought that the dark tone was too much for a comic book movie, and this darkness allegedly was the reason why Tim Burton was not invited back for any more Batman movies. I'm sure he was fine with. He did try to do the superhero thing again with Nicolas Cage playing Superman, but of course, as we all know, that never took flight. Then Tim Burton went back to working with everybody's favorite wickedly magical Mickey Mouse movie making factory and brought us the Nightmare Before Christmas. And it is the most Tim Burton-y movie ever made, but it's not actually directed by Tim Burton. Timmy Boy provided the story and served as producer, while it was actually helmed by director Henry Selick. Who does not get enough R-E-S-P-E-C-T? Find out what it means to Henry. But directed by him or not, like I said, this is the quintessential Tim Burton movie and has his name literally all over it, but not his director, but whatever. Tim Burton was at his most marketable and Disney sure wanted to take advantage of that, turning this movie, The Nightmare Before Christmas, into a marketing merchandise movie madhouse for multiple holidays. Could this be where the pigeon holding truly began? Is this where all the pigeons were held? And what did Santa bring you, honey? In 1994, Tim Burton again turned in a passion project, Ed Wood. The true story of a filmmaker who is widely considered the worst filmmaker of all time. And funny enough, the movie about making bad movies is, in the opinion of many, Tim Burton's best movie. Tim Burton cared so deeply for the subject that he didn't even take a salary. Other than the obvious ties to the art form, Ed Wood also offers another chief parallel in his life, as the Ed Wood and Bela Lugosi mentor bond links beautifully 
to that of the friendship of Tim Burton and Vincent Price. And Martin Landau's performance earned him an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. A truly well-deserved unholy golden idol. If I do say so myself, and myself it does say so. Ed Wood is one of Tim Burton's most grounded pictures, but you still feel his otherworldly essence in every scene. I just love the way that Tim Burton plays with the shadows in this beautiful black and white film, and how the entire cast hits every hilarious mark. It's a love letter to cinema. The wood, the bad and the ugly. <laughs> It kind of makes you wish that there were more Ed Woods out there for Tim Burton to make movies about. I like to dress in women's clothing. After Ed Wood, Tim Burton sought yet another adaptation. This time from, of all things, trading cards with his film Mars Attacks. It was a cheeky, daffy, and poppy send-up to B-movie sci-fi flicks of the good old days. Many consider this to be one of Tim Burton's lesser works, and is thought of as being out of touch with what audiences wanted, mostly due to it being released the same damn year as Independence Day. If you understand the joke of Mars Attacks, then it is a fun time at the movies. But if you don't, I can see how it can be seen as a stupid silly mess. Don't get me wrong, I love me some Mars Attacks, but many of the characters are too one-dimensional, even when spoofing an archetype. But whatever, it's funny, I like it. Mars Attacks marks a bit of a turning point for Tim Burton, as he was getting a little bit out of control, with the visuals overtaking the storytelling, and character development, and logic and reason. This was something that would soon enough prove to be a defeating aspect to Burton's films. Tim Burton wrapped up his prolific 1990s with Sleepy Hollow, which truly utilized the Burton-esque style perfectly between its design and its story. Sleepy Hollow garnered the most nominations of Tim Burton's career to that point, and it rightfully won the Oscar for Best Art Direction. And like it or not, Sleepy Hollow may be his last genuinely great film. It's the perfect Tim Burton movie with a thrilling R-rated edge. It was so great that Hollywood and Tim Burton got confused by its success, and from then on out, pretty much just tried to replicate Sleepy Hollow's successful formula of giving Tim Burton a popular intellectual property and letting him Burtonize himself all over it. Like his next movie. The studio was like, Here, Tim, have Planet of the Apes, but make the monkeys emo and stuff. Many consider this one to be his first truly awful film. Which I do think gets a little too much hate, but yeah, it's definitely not good. But the monkey makeup effects are wonderful. Except for Helena Bonham Carter's eyebrows, which were added to make her more attractive to us humans, but it, it just freaked us out, I think. And why is Hollywood trying to make us attracted to monkeys? Actually, I know why. Despite being his biggest box office opening, nearly $70 million, Planet of the Apes falls victim to a rushed production, and a nonsensical ending setting up a sequel that nobody wanted, and that horrible reputation, well, it rests to this day. And actually, this film, Planet of the Apes, has gotten only worse as time goes on, especially after we got that really great Planet of the Apes franchise later. Tim Burton went partly autobiographical again for 2003's Big Fish, experimenting with more colors this time as he plays around with a fairy tale like atmosphere that is actually a really sad family drama at its heart, perfectly casting Ewan McGregor as this happy go lucky protagonist. I'm assuming Johnny Depp was busy. Big Fish is easily his most touching work 
and signaled what could have been a major shift in his style. But no. In the year 2005, we saw the film Corpse Bride. Tim Burton finally earned his own Oscar nomination this time. It was a decent effort with some beautiful stop motion, but the overall film and the story were somewhat forgettable. And then the true downfall crept in with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. This was the tragic beginning of Tim Burton adapting properties that didn't need to be adapted at all. When you watch this movie, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you feel like you ate too much sugar, which brought on an hour and 55 minute nightmare candy coma that can't even come close to capturing the spirit of the original or even mark its own purpose. I would rather go down that tunnel of horror from the original than watch this mess of a movie again. Style over substance to the max, mofo. Good morning, starshine. The Earth says hello. Of course, there is a slight exception during this downfall of Burton when it comes to his adaptation of Sweeney Todd. This musical is a wonderfully conceived attempt at bringing the famous play to life, and it, and it succeeds. It totally works, and it nabbed the director his first and only Golden Globe nomination for Best Director back when people cared about the Golden Globes. This violent, well-crafted epic gave us all hope that the Chocolate Factory was just a once-in-a-career mishap. But no. Then that downward spin began anew with a string of more pointless adaptations created only to showcase style over substance, like 2010's Alice in Wonderland. It is a grotesque, overwhelmingly dizzy disaster that amounts to nothing. This freaking movie gave me headaches and annoyed me to the point that I don't even think I finished watching it. And the fact that it was shot in 2D and then converted into 3D showed a lack of confidence in its own bankability. 2012's Dark Shadows is perhaps Tim Burton's ultimate example of self-parody, adapting a property that doesn't need the Tim Burton touch. And of course, it starred Johnny Depp. And oh yeah, his wife again, or at the time. Are they, I don't, are they together still? I can't keep track. It feels like everyone's hearts were in the right place this time, but unfortunately, Dark Shadows stands as his worst reviewed movie. And it ended up feeling kind of pointless, despite featuring a stellar cast. Johnny Depp as a vampire? How do you f that up? But he did. What have they done to you? That same year, Tim Burton did what he tends to do when he's unsure of his previous project. He goes back into that spooky little world of his, like with the movie Frankenweenie, the feature film. Tim Burton adapted his own short film. If anything, this is a clear demonstration that Tim Burton is at his best when he's doing a project that he can personally connect to. I would not call this one a masterpiece or anything, but it is nice to watch a Tim Burton movie that feels like it came straight out of the scribbles of his notebook from all those years ago. I think I like what Frankenweenie represents more than I like the movie itself. But it did seem to resurrect his dead dog of a career for a bit. Next came the film Big Eyes a smaller movie that allowed Tim Burton to delve into making interesting characters again. Big Eyes is a Burton film that doesn't get talked about enough. It is based on a true story, so it's definitely grounded, but Tim Burton still allows moments of gothic surrealism to shine through at exactly the right moments. A little Tim Burton goes a long way. And this film, Big Eyes, it shows how great Tim Burton is at directing actors like Amy Adams and Christoph Waltz, who turn in some of the best work of their career here. So at this time, we all kind of had hope for Mr. Tim Burton again, but that hope usually fizzles out with his next project as it did with 2016's Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. 
it's an interesting movie to look at. Like, it's got nice art direction and stuff. And it doesn't provide really anything else than looking like a Tim Burton movie. So it becomes easily forgettable. But Samuel L. Jackson sure seems to be having a good time. Tim Burton's most recent film, Dumbo, is a big catastrophe with zero charm. And it plays like Tim Burton needed a guaranteed hit. Not because he directed it, but because the intellectual property is so famous. I don't know, I really don't like these CGI live-action Disney remake things. And Dumbo is the worst of the worst. This production was the nail in the coffin for Tim Burton and Disney. The director called working with Disney like its own horrible big circus. Dumbo is the ultimate example of how a Tim Burton movie can go wrong. And we all know that he can do better than this. And surely there are more great things from Tim Burton to come. For starters, there's Netflix's Wednesday, which does indeed seem to have the style and the wittiness of Tim Burton's best work. With a 71% critic score! and an 87% audience score on that website that has those tomatoes that are rotten.com if you trust tomatoes. And yeah, those reviews are not bad. They're not good enough to make me want to watch it, though. I'm kind of Tim Burtoned out right now. But I'm glad that Wednesday is not completely horrible. But apparently it's racist or something. I don't know. What the f***? So yeah, now what? What could Tim Burton do that hasn't already been done or recycled? At some point, Tim Burton seemed to turn into a self-parody, skating by on the brand and rarely putting out material that felt original. All directors have their trademarks, and Tim Burton's marks of his trade are some of the most imaginative to ever grace the silver screen. But lately, it does feel that Tim Burton has become comfortably numb with just adapting other people's material and just adding in some eyeliner or whatever. Unfortunately, sometimes it just feels like he wants to play dress up with Johnny Depp. But I mean, who doesn't? And even though lately we have been slightly disappointed, I guarantee you that Tim Burton still has fascinating, heartbreakingly, darkly humorous and charming original stories in his head that one day will come out, hopefully without any studio interference. But I ask, is it too late for that? Another pinnacle is Ed Wood, which makes one think. Tim Burton by no means is a bad director and is nowhere close to being compared to the worst director of all time. He's not even close to being in that conversation. But it's the failed ambitions and the big dreams that fizzle out into forgettable fare that often call to mind the real life Ed Wood. Really? Worst film you ever saw? Well, my next one will be better. So then, what is a Tim Burton film? Is Tim Burton just a style? And is that style enough to make an impact on our society and our pop culture? I think so. With his films, this man practically created a subculture and provided a voice and a wardrobe to the freaks, the weirdos, and the outcasts all over the world. And people who just like to wear black. And not many filmmakers can say that their work has had an effect on multiple generations in such a way. Scratch that, not many artists in general in any medium can say that they have had that type of an impact. And no one can take that away from Tim Burton, no matter how many YouTube videos are made about him. Which makes Tim Burton the best at what he does. And what he does will always have a place in our hearts and our DVD collections and our Netflix queues and our Halloween decorations. 
and Christmas. So nobody should give a f about what the f happened to Tim Burton, because he's doing just fine.